amazing. You guys sound so good. Come on. Somebody, tell somebody, you sound pretty good. Tell them right now. Tell them. Find someone. Say, you sounded better than I remember. You sounded better than I remember. I'm so glad that you guys are here today. I want to welcome you, whether you're watching online, whether you are here in Gulf Breeze, whether you're in the bar or at Blackwater, all our different campuses. I want to say thank you for coming. You know, the truth is, uh, the truth is, I'm so proud of y'all for not letting rain keep you from God's best. So proud of you for that. Um, you know, we really don't have to brave the weather too much around here. We live in a great place. And, but I'm thankful that you didn't let something like rain keep you from coming to the house today. I'm not going to let rain keep me from work. I ain't going to let it keep me from the house. Are you with me? So I'm so proud of y'all for doing that. And I uh, just want to say, before you sit down, in the presence of the Lord today, I really truly believe that there's something for someone here today. You're discouraged. You feel defeated. You feel depressed. You feel like you're in a rut. You can't get out. You can't overcome. You can't win. You feel like it's over. And I want to tell you, it's not over. It's not over. It's not over. It's not over. Just because what you're feeling today, I want to tell you how you change your feelings. You change your feelings through faith. Faith is what we hope for without seeing what we hope to happen. That's what faith is. And so when we sing that song, give me faith, I might be weak. I, my flesh may fail, but my God, you never will. So, so we just take our eyes off of ourselves, off of our problems, our trials, our circumstances, and we put our eyes back on Jesus. And I love that at Momentum. We love to point to Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. First nautical marker in our code. It's all about Jesus. You know why? Because it's all about Jesus. And so if you're here today and you don't have a lot to be excited about, you don't have a lot to really feel like in your life right now, like you're winning, two things. Number one, be thankful for what God's done in the past. Thank God for what he's done in the past. And faith will allow you to thank him for what he's going to do in the future. And the reason why that works is because God tells us, come into my presence with thanksgiving. He says, enter into my courts with praise. So we thank God for what he's done. But we don't, sometimes we say, praise God, he did this for me. What we meant to say is, thank God, he did this for me. But praise God, because God is still God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He was grace back then. He's grace today. He'll be grace tomorrow. He was love back then. He's love today. He'll be love tomorrow. He was mercy back then. He's mercy today. He will be mercy tomorrow. Great is your faithfulness. And when you begin to praise God for who he is, the enemy loses his grip. He loses his grasp. He loses control. We went rock climbing high school camp this summer. We're climbing up this 40 foot. It was a little taller than that, but the, the bell that didn't work was 40 feet up. And we went up, we slapped that thing. We just, yeah, we slapped that thing. But on your way up, you wanted to quit. On the way up, your strength was telling you you don't have any more. On the way up, you were losing your grip, your muscles shaking. Your mind, if you're not careful, telling you, I can't, I can't, I can't. But when we can't, we just fall back because he can. Someone needs that here today. Someone thinks it's over, and God says it's not over. God says, I am still the same today as I was yesterday, and I'll be the same in your tomorrow. So give them your fears. Give them your cares. Give them your worries. Give them your problems. Give them your failures and your faults. Why? Because he's great, and he's greatly be praised. Someone need that today, and I, I just pray that you receive that today into your spirit. To you receive that, you know what happened? You receive that, it will bloom. It will bloom right on time, right when you need it. Thank you, guys. You can be seated. God is doing amazing things, and I, I just want to share a few things with you. Um, where there's no vision, people perish. And uh, I just want to tell you real quick as we jump into today, I want to tell you what God is doing. Some amazing things. I'm going to spread it out over the next couple weeks. There's several things that God's been up to. But 
But one of the things is we launched live stream. We launched it a few weeks ago. As Matt said, yeah. Here's what's so big about that is people are able to watch all over the world. People who are sick, people who are traveling, they got business, whatever. It takes them away from home. They can watch online. And we saw the effectiveness of it last week where a lady, a friend, um, a new friend out in Oklahoma City watched online and she gave her life to Jesus. Isn't that awesome? She crossed the line of faith online, the online line of faith. She did. She gave her life to Jesus. That's what it's about. God wants us to reach more people with the story of his love and his goodness and his grace. And so just last gathering, we had 121 people watching online. Just, and it, and it, it comes on at the 9, the 11, the 5 p.m., the 7 p.m., and then people watch it all week long. So if you're joining us today, wherever you are, wherever you are, we got friends in Atlanta watching, we got friends in Guatemala watching, wherever you are, we want to say thank you for jumping in, thank you for watching with us, and uh, let's clap for them, can we? Let's do that. Yeah, well, we're clapping. Let's give it up for Blackwater, all the men that joined us. Yeah, we're going to be there tonight. Can't wait to see you guys. How about Navarre? Let's give it up, Navarre. We're glad you guys came out. Thank you so much. And go free. Show some love. Here we go. Come on. So we're in this series, and this series is called Friendship Goals. And today, we're going to land the plane on this series. And this series has been all about our friends. And th is, is there anything better than great friends? I mean, friends are everything. And all you have to do to realize how important, valuable friends are is get in a place where you don't have any. Or remember a time when you didn't have any. That's all you got to be. Or you lose a friend. Friendship goals. And we talked about how we shouldn't just fall into friendship. You shouldn't just fall into friendship. We talk about making friends, but the truth is sometimes we make friends based off of similar interests. But we need to make sure we have similar values. Because just because someone has your interest, if they don't have your values, they're not going to be a good friend. In fact, they're going to pull you down. We talked about that. And so friendship matters. We talked about we ought to have goals for the people that we allow in our life. Now, Jesus, don't get me wrong. Jesus was a friend of sinners. Jesus loved people that were nothing like him. Completely opposite. Jesus loved them. In fact, the religious people in Jesus' day, it ticked them off. They couldn't stand the fact that Jesus was a friend of sinners. So I'm not talking about you only, it's us four and no more. We're Christians and we shut the door. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking about is be friendly to people. People, some people, listen, you're the only Bible some people will ever read. You're the only Jesus some people will ever experience. How's their experience going? So we want to be friendly, and it's okay to love people that are nothing like us. That's what Jesus did. He was professional at loving people that were nothing like him. And people nothing like Jesus loved Jesus. You know why? Because love wins the day. You know why? Because love overcomes. Love's the greatest. It's the, it's the greatest. I mean, drop the mic. When love shows up, it's over. Love wins. And yet, when we're talking about our friends, we're talking about our inner circle, the people we let in closest to us. Jesus had Peter, James, and John. It's all through the scripture. You'll see this, where people had people close to them. And just like in the Bible, in our lives, we can all look back at a time when it was messy. We can all look back at a time where we hurt. We can all remember a time. Where all of a sudden we're like, what? What happened that year? Like 2015, holy cow. Like why does that stand out so bad? And then all of a sudden if you're, if you're just a little intentional, it's the people around you. And when we have the right, how many know? How many, come on. How many people know that when you have the right people around you, life is better? And we're wearing the green shirts. Life is better. And what's the word? Together. But that is only true when you have the right people around you. It's better together. All right. And so the, the principle for this whole series has been this, that the friends we let in, the people we let in real close to us. That is so important because our friends will determine our direction. And the quality, whether good or bad. The quality of our lives, the direction. 
will be determined by our friends. And the quality will be determined by your friends. That, that, that's the people you let in. It's the people you surround yourself. And here in this, in this story, we've been talking about um, this, this story that's really a soap opera is what it is. I don't know if you ever watched soap opera, but you ought to read your Bible, man. It's got some stories in there, and this is one of them. In fact, this opens up a trilogy of soap operas. I mean, as the world turns, this story unfolds, and, and, and it starts out, and I want to give you a little context. I want to give you some context to what is happening here, and here's the reason why you need to listen today, because this just isn't a Bible story that we picked out. This isn't just something that's, ah, that's fine. He told me a Bible story, a Bible story. Listen, listen. This is a principle that you can build your life, and you can build it to the top. You can build it to the top. If you're not careful, if you ignore this principle, what will happen is you will let anybody in your life. And what will happen is you will dumb down. You will dumb down the quality that you're looking for. You've seen it happen before. Maybe you've done it before. You, you get a little bit older and you think, man, I'm still single. And, and, and then, then, you know, you wanted this guy. And then you wanted this guy. <laughs> and then you like this guy. <laughs> and th those three guys never showed up. And you're like, any guy. And then you met any guy. And you're like, wrong guy. <laughs> you with me? See, a fool in the Bible is someone who is just open to anything. Just whatever. It's whatever. They don't stand for conviction. They don't have character. They don't have integrity. They just do whatever they want to do. They are led by their feelings or they're led by their emotions. They're not a person of character. And, and, and here's what I know. This story really just opens up this story. And, and I would tell you, you ought to read your Bibles. You ought to get into the Bible. You say, I don't have a Bible. Download you version. It's free. You can have it right there in your palm, in your hand, wherever you go. You can have version. You can follow along today in the notes. Go to version. events, more, Momentum Church, click save. You can do that. You ought to follow along. You ought to get in God's word because here's what happens. When you get in God's word, God's word gets in you, and all of a sudden you begin to see as God sees. And here's the principle. When I see, when you see, when we see as God sees, in other words, when we understand as God understands, then we will do what God says. It's, it's a no-brainer. Sometimes we think, no, no, no. You remember being a kid. Your parents said something. You're like, ah, come on, mom, dad. They don't know anything. I'm going to do whatever I want. And they're like, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. I remember for me, dad was a pastor at a church, Shelbyville, Tennessee, or as they say, Shelbyville, Tennessee. And I remember there, was, there were these stairs going down to the youth room. And I would jump up, and I would see how many pull-ups I could do. After about 300, it got a little tired. No, I'm just kidding. I would jump up. I would jump up. And one day, and I would swing. And then I would jump from, the, from there past all the stairs. And I remember one day, dad told me, he said, son, don't do that. If you slip, you'll hurt yourself. The problem is I heard what dad said, but I didn't believe the word if. Because I'm not going to slip. How many know <laughs> that's, that's exactly all it takes right there? That's all it takes, young people. And I thought, that's not going to happen to me. I'm going to get a couple more in. And sure enough, I did that, and I went to swing. And when I did, I lost my grip, and I fell in that, that corner of the stair. It was wood, and if my memory serves me correct, my back was assuring me that it was wood. <laughs> Hit me, and next thing I know, I'm in the hospital. And so who, listen, who we listen to matters. The right kind of people are going to tell us the right kind of things. They're going to say, whoa, 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 watch out. Don't, don't, don't do that. Ah, you shouldn't do that. But a fool is someone's just open to anything. Whatever. What do you think? What do you think? I think I don't care. You want it? Yeah, sure. Okay, all right. And they're just open to whatever. But the right people in our lives, they will love us no matter what happens. Do you have the right people in your life? I want you to think about it. Do you have wise friends? Or do you just have friends that you just, well, I made, I, we, we met in Publix, we met at the gym and, and whatever, and it's the interesting but not the value thing. So the relationship at the end of the day crumbles because it's not based off of values or value. It's based off of I like, I like. And next thing you know, the people you let into your life determine where you go. 
Because all of a sudden you start doing things you never did. All of a sudden you start finding yourself in places you would never end up before. You start saying, oh, sure, whatever. Or the opposite. The opposite is true. Scripture says as iron sharpens iron, so the countenance or the face-to-face of a friend. Do you have the right kind of people in your life? You know, talk about your peeps. Talking about your squad, your tribe, your BFFs. Do you have the right people in your life? Don't just make friends, choose them wisely. And, and here's what I encourage you to do. When you look for good friends, pick godly friends. Because it's not just enough to have good friends. You want godly friends. Because when your life hits turbulence, the devil is going to tell you, forget God. Job's wife told Job that. The devil told Eve that. He's going to say, forget God. And you're going to need people that will keep you grounded. You with me? You're going to need people in your life to help you stay in your lane. You know when you're driving on the road, especially like the interstate, and, and sometimes, boy, they have, if you go off the side, man, there's not only a guardrail there, but there are the reflectors, there are the bumps, and you get back in your lane, you know. And, and that's what the Holy Spirit does. And sometimes the Holy Spirit, he'll speak that to your heart, but sometimes he'll speak it to your heart through the people in your life, through godly friends. And if we're not careful, sin is such a slippery slope. And we think, well, I can do this and get away with it. I can do this. I can do this. And it's like the tar baby. Before you know it, you are in and you can't get out. And there's consequences. So we've been telling this story. And we've been talking about there was a bad friend who gave bad advice. Bad friend gave bad advice. In this story, David is really where it picks up. And we're in 2 Samuel. And David makes a bad choice. And we get to choose our sin, but we never get to choose our consequences. And David chooses Bathsheba. She's married, but he says, I want her. I saw her naked. I have to have her. And that same thing is going to come back in his son. That same sin is going to boomerang back. That same lust is going to grow even bigger. And he sees Bathsheba. He kills her husband. And then God sends a man of God who was friends with David, who loved him enough to tell him the truth. Now, let's talk about this for a minute. Great friends will love you enough to tell you the truth. God cannot fix you if you do not listen to what God is trying to say. Can I get an amen? Thank you. Can I get a louder amen? amen. Can everybody say amen? amen? Can all God's people say amen? amen. God allows us sometimes to go through hardship. Sometimes he allows us to go through trials. And God puts people in our life not to be nice to us necessarily, but to be good for us. And and here's how you know those people. You know those people because they love you and they've earned the right to speak the truth. Sometimes kids say, my parents don't love me. They told me not to play with razor blade. Around my wrist. Now that's silly. But a parent who loves their kid would say, no, don't do that. But as we grow up, we can have friends in our lives that they see us going. I mean, I prayed with a lady last gathering. Her and her husband and family went to church. All of a sudden, he's like, I'm out. He's willing to throw, throw away 13 years of marriage and children. He's out. You know why? Because sin is a slippery slope. You know why? Because he just veered off a little bit. But you, you just veer off a little bit. I mean, we went shooting yesterday, Dad. You can be off just a little bit. And when you go the distance, it gets further off the target, further off the mark. It's the people, man. It's the people. One of the things I would tell you if we were hanging out together and you're like, Pastor Tim, man, can you give me some wisdom? I'm struggling right now. I would say, who is around you? Who is around you? If you're a business person... Do you have people in your life that, are, that, that have gone higher, that have made more money, that still love their families, that are blessed, that made incredibly wise decisions, that own companies? Have you surrounded yourself around them? If not, you got iron, but you need iron because iron sharpens iron. So it's who we let in 
that determines. And David, David, David made a wrong decision. And that decision, Nathan says, the man of God, he says, listen, this soap opera, he's like, man, it's fixing to get ugly. God's going to forgive you. You are a man after God's own heart, and God will forgive our sins, but we still have to pay the consequences. Are you with me? Still got to do that. Thief on the cross turns to Jesus, been cussing him all morning and early afternoon. And finally, finally, after all the blasphemy, and you think you blaspheme God too much. After all his blasphemy on the cross, he turns to Jesus and he says, remember me, be come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, time out, let him off the cross. He just got saved. No, he still had to pay for sins. Earthly. And that happens to us too. What's interesting is he was up there with another guy who they've gotten in trouble together. Are you with me? It's the people. Someone say it's the people. Turn to person, turn to person beside you. Give him a little slug bug punch. Go ahead, give him a little punch. Let's see it happen. I like, yes, man, she did it. She said, you smiled. You were like, I've been waiting to do that all day. <laughs> I love it, right? It, it's the people that we surround ourselves with. And then David has a son, and he names his firstborn son Amnon. And Amnon had a friend, and his friend was Jonadab. He, Jonadab, he's his cubs. And Amnon saw his half-sister, and boy, she was beautiful. She was so beautiful. She was so beautiful. Daddy, the king, said, keep them boys away. How many know daddies? That's the thing to do. <laughs> keep them boys away. And uh, <laughs> I got a girl. I'll say amen. Riley's 10. I told her, Riley, you start dating when you're about 95, maybe, maybe 92. And I told her now. I say it often. I want you to know, any guy, any guy that you think is worthy of your heart has to win my heart first. Has to win mama's heart. Has to win Jaden's heart. Has to win Gavin's heart. And our dog, Coco. You got to, if my dog don't like you, I don't like you. I'm sorry, we got a Rottweiler. We might have a couple by the time she's 13. 16, 18. Bring, yeah, bring them boys over to the house. Sure. <laughs> Oh, man, the people, the people. And Amnon had a friend, Jonadab, and Jonadab gives bad advice. He's a bad friend, bad friend, bad friend. <laughs> Hashtag preacher preach on bad friend. <laughs> How do you know when you have a bad friend? They give bad advice. They, they, their advice never matches up with God's advice. And how you know the difference is you always weigh advice against the Almighty. What did God say? There's something about the fear of the Lord that is still the beginning of wisdom. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. Why? Because they're open to whatever. They don't care. They don't care what God, they don't have time. They're going to do their own thing. They're just open. And God says, don't be foolish. Don't hang around foolish people. Walk with the wise and you will be wise. Are the people in your life wise? Some of us, we talked about two weeks ago, we need to do a friend inventory. Yeah, they're your bro. Yeah, she's your girl. But are they wise? Are they, are they pulling out the best you? Or are they pulling you down to their level? You see, here's what I know, especially when you're single, right? When you're single, like, you, 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 man, you know, I'm just dating and I'm waiting. And the truth is I want to be mating, but I'm just waiting for the right person, Pastor Tim, to get in my life. And God bring that person and you just dumb it down. And next thing you know, and, and the big lie is just, just pray for the right one. That's important, but that's the second base. First base is be the right person. And you will attract the right person. That didn't have to come out through the secret, the book. That came out through his book. He said, be, so, so listen, if you're single, don't look for the right one. Don't just pray for the right one. You be the right one. And here's what I know. Here's what I know. Unhealthy people do not attract healthy people. Unhealthy people do not keep healthy people. Unhealthy people leave. They get away. I don't want to be around that. I don't want to be, and they, and, and they, and they exit quickly. So true. I've been there before on both sides. I've been there. I'm trying to tell you the truth today. Who you surround yourself matters. And Jonadab says, man, why are you looking so sad, man? You, you the king's son. There's a message there. I'm going to preach that one. Why are we looking so sad? We're the king's sons. We're the king's daughters. Come on. Come on. We are highly favored. 
Are you with? We are highly favored. If God's for us, who can be against us? There's no condemnation. I'm in Jesus, man. He doesn't even remember my sin. As far as the east is from the west, so far God has removed my sin. When God looks at me, he smiles and goes, mm-hmm, that's my boy. And he's perfect. Perfect because of Jesus. But Amnon had a friend. And he said, hey, why are you so sad? You, you king's son, man. Get, get, uh, oh, oh, I love Tamar, half-sister. And I can't have her. Why couldn't he have her? Because he was here and she was there. He knew she would. Ne- he knew he would never attract her because he knew where he wasn't and where my God, where she was. See, vision is totally different when you're a giraffe to when you're a chicken. Chickens don't attract giraffes. Chickens don't. Let me say it like this: they don't attract eagles because the vision is different. And the eagle's like, I ain't getting on that ground. I ain't stepping in your chicken poo. I was meant to fly. And I'm not going to go just take that dead animal. I take him alive because I'm an eagle and that's, how, that's what we do. Are you with me? Because I fly higher. And when the storm comes, that's cool. I'm not going to curse the storm. I'm going to rise above the storm. I'm an eagle, man. That's what I do. It's the people. And... Jonah Dab said, man, here's your problem, man. Here's your problem. Go to your dad. Ask. Have her. She's a virgin. She wasn't supposed to be home alone with another guy. There was some, there was some things there to protect her, some guardrails, if you please. And just go ask your dad. He's a king. He'll, he'll give it to you. So sure enough, he, he goes, David, hey, can Tamar come? Cook for me. And that's exactly what happens. Let's go to verse 6. We'll pick up the story in the NLT. Verse 6. So we see bad friend gives bad advice. Now there's a bad decision. So Amnon laid down and pretended to be sick. And when the king came to see him, Amnon asked him, please let my sister Tamar come and cook my favorite dish as I watch. Then I can eat it from her own hand. So David agreed. Well, maybe this will help him. Maybe, maybe this will help him. His problem, his problem was lust. His problem was a sin problem. Sometimes, listen to me, listen to me. And I've been here before, but sometimes sin Is what leads to depression. Oftentimes, really, depression is from anger that has just been pushed down. And so it depresses us. And instead of David doing what was right, he agreed. Verse 7. So David agreed. And he sent Tamar to Amnon's house. Why? To prepare some food for him. When Tamar arrived at Amnon's house, she went to the place where he was lying down. So he could watch her mix some dough. We have some donuts. This Krispy Kreme going on. She's mixing some dough or maybe pizza. I'm not sure. But then she baked his favorite dish for him. But that wasn't enough. See, lust consumes. Lust says, give me a little bit and I'll be satisfied. I'm just going to watch a little porn. Not a lot of porn, just light porn, not hard porn. Just a little bit. Then she baked his favorite dish for him when she... Set the serving tray before him. He refused to eat. Everybody, get out of here. She should have ran. Amnon told his servants, get out of here. So they all left. By the way, they were there for protection. Then he said to Tamar, now bring the food into my, someone say bedroom. Isn't this kind of feeling like a soap opera? And feed it to me here. Getting real demanding. Because lust isn't what's best for you. Lust is what's best for me. Love. A guy tells you he loves you. Girl tells you she loves you. What's best for you? That's what matters. Now bring the food in my bedroom. Feed it to me here. So Tamar took his favorite dish to him. But as she was feeding him, he grabbed her and he demanded, come to bed with me, my darling sister. No, my brother, she cried. Don't be foolish. And she's going to give him five reasons why he shouldn't do this. Don't be foolish. Don't do this to me. Such wicked things are not done in Israel or as some translations say in all of Israel. Where could I go in my shame? And you, you would be called one of the greatest, what's the word? Someone say fools. Fools. Why? Because he was open to anything. He's saying yes, she's saying no. That's called rape. But he's at this point even open to it. Because he's got to have what he wants. You know why? Because he had fed his appetite. Be careful because your appetite can consume you. What are you feasting on? What do you think about? What do you look at? What do you let go that no one else knows? And you're like, I don't want some more of that. No one else. We keep my little secret. To young people, sometimes it's Snapchat. 
What happens on Snapchat doesn't stay on Snapchat. It goes away. So sometimes young people do things and say things and take pictures and that kind of stuff. And, and it's not a secret, man. But sometimes they think parents are too dumb enough. They won't find me. They won't see me. You know, all my friends will laugh. My parents won't know. Hey, don't be deceived. Don't be mocked. For whatever you reap, you'll sow. The Bible says the eyes of the Lord are in every place beholding the evil and the good. God sees it all. He sees it all. He knows it all. And she's saying, don't be foolish. You'll be the greatest. You'll be the number one fool in Israel. So please, just let me speak to the king about it. Now watch, watch, watch. And he will let you marry me. What? She calls him brother. In Leviticus 18, 19, it says that if you slept with, this is the law, it says that if you slept with your brother or sister, that was a capital punishment worthy of death. So she pleads to him. She calls him brother. Hey, just remind you, we're brother and sister. You could die for this. But listen, listen, listen. Lust consumes. It's like a fire. It'll consume whatever's in front of it. So number two, she challenges him. Don't be foolish. In other words, she's like, I'm not a fool, but you're acting foolish. Don't be open to this. I'm not open to this. Number three, she condemns it as wickedness. Deuteronomy 22, 25 through 27, again, reminding them. They knew that. Just like we have speed limit signs posted, they knew what that said. You do it, you die. And then number four, she says, you'll never be able to conceal or to hide the shame. For all your life, you'll be the biggest fool and the shame for it. Don't do that. And then number five, she was confident that if he would ask the king, the king would give him what he wanted because he was a son to the king. Sometimes we try to do something in our own flesh instead of asking the king, who's our father, to do the right thing. And if we get ahead of the king, we're out of line. Are you with me? And that's what happens here. And she pleads with him, don't, don't, don't do it. But he's a fool. He's not going to listen. But Amnon wouldn't listen to her. And since he was stronger than she was, he raped her. Now, I understand this story, man. This is like a rated R story. There might be people here. You're listening. You're watching online. You're right here in Gulf Breeze. You've been raped before. And I want to tell you something. I'll not make light of that. And I want to tell you that God can take your darkest hour. And because of his saving grace, because of his love, because he does make all things new, he can, he can let your darkest hour become your very power. He can do that. He can allow the mess of your past and the shame and the hurt. And, and you carry that secret for years, years, years. You need to tell somebody. You need to let go of it. You've been, you've been carrying it too long. And you know what will happen? If you allow, God can take what the enemy meant for evil. And he will use it for good. And he will take your pain and create a platform that will help other people that have been hurt just like you were hurt. I'm trying to preach today. Are you with me? That's what God can do. So just because it doesn't mean life is over. And that's a horrible thing, a wicked thing. It was wicked then. It's wicked now. Amnon didn't care. He's a fool. So he raped her, the Bible said. Then suddenly, interesting what sin will do. Sin will take your heart that's positioned one way and turn it completely opposite. Listen to this. Then suddenly Amnon's love turned to hate. What? I thought he loved her. Love don't turn on a dime to hate like that. And he hated her even more than he had loved her. Why? Because love and lust are different. Things that are different, not the same. He said, get out of here. He snarled at her. No, no, Tamar cried. Sending me away now is worse than what you've already done to me. She was now supposed to be his. And now he's rejecting her because he didn't want her. He wanted what her could do for him. That's how we knew it was lust and not love. But Amnon wouldn't listen to her. He shouted for a servant and demanded, throw this woman out and lock the door behind her. Bad decision. And we talked about, yeah, you may make, you may have bad friends. You can do something about them. You can... Listen to bad advice, but just because you listen to bad advice doesn't mean you have to follow bad advice. But I want to tell you, man, you make a bad decision, number four, there's a bad consequence. And the deal with sin is we do get to pick our sins. We just don't get to pick our consequences. For whatever reason, the story that I told you about in between the gatherings, this lady was telling me, and I'm praying for her. This guy is choosing his sin over his family. The problem is the consequence down the road will always remind him of his sin. 
Are you with me? It will always linger. You walk out on your family, you leave your kids because you fell out of love. What is that? Fell out of love? No, love's a decision. And at the altar, you said you did, for better or for worse. And I don't think you erased that. I think it was still said, still spoken before God, before your friends, before your family. Like, that's what love does. Love hangs around when it gets messy. Love's like a fireman, man, that runs into the fire. It doesn't run out when it gets hot. Runs towards it. That's what love does. And love covers a multitude of sins. And in this story, now we're going to see a bad consequence because for two years, listen to this, I'll just read it. I'll read, listen to this, verse 18. So the servant put her out, locked the door behind her. She was wearing a long, beautiful robe, as was custom in those days for a king's virgin daughters. But now Tamar tore her robe. She put ashes on her head. And then with her hands in her face, she went away crying. And her brother Absalom saw her. And he asks, is it true Amnon has been with you? And he can see by her tears. He can see by the pain in her eyes. Well, and anger is just, man, be careful of anger. The Bible says be angry and don't sin. Anger will burn so fast, it'll burn you. And now it's starting to burn Absalom. And he says, well, my sister. He says, keep quiet for now since he's your brother, but don't you worry about it. So Tamar lived as a, listen to this, she was beautiful, remember? She lived as a desolate, that means lonely, woman in her brother Absalom's house instead of with the man of her dreams. When King David heard what had happened, he was angry, very angry. And though Absalom never spoke to Amnon about this, he hated Amnon deeply because of what he had done to his sister. Sin always boomerangs back with consequences. See, David chose his sin, but he couldn't choose his consequence. David became an adulterer, and David became a murderer. And David thought it would just end with him. But the problem is our sin sometimes is surpassed by our children. Well, mom and dad did, so they take it to a whole nother level. And Amnon thought, who's dad? Who's dad to correct me? Who's dad to say anything to me? Bathsheba, hello. Dad can't say anything to me. And dad won't discipline me. Dad's not going to get on to me. It's going to make him angry. It's going to make him upset. He's not going to like that it happened. But, but dad's not, dad's not going to, dad, he ain't going to do it. Dad's not going to do it. What, what's he going to do? He messed up. What's he going to do? And listen to me. Listen, listen here, parents. David failed. He did love. Last week I said it's not enough to just be a man or a woman after God's own heart. You want your family to be a family after God's own heart. Amen. Joshua said, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Sometimes even when your family doesn't know the Lord, doesn't serve the Lord, you speak that out by faith just so the devil can hear it. Just so the devil remembers that you are still standing in faith. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And, but now all of a sudden, David whose firstborn son, Amnon, does something that's unbelievable. Well, daddy did it. And then daddy doesn't discipline him. And so you know what happens? For two years, Amnon fills up with revenge. For two years, he thinks about it. He thinks about it. You've been there before, haven't you? Someone failed you. Someone's talked about you. Someone wronged you, and you thought about it. And then you thought about it, and you thought about it some more, and you thought about it some more. And the more you thought about it, and the more you talked about it. And the more you talked about it, the more angry you became about it. And it's been five years. I'm not going to fall off. Don't worry. We get right there on the edge with our anger sometimes, don't we? We get right there. And that's exactly what happened. That's where it took him. I want to ask you a question today. Where are you at? And who are you with? Because those friends will determine the direction and the quality of your life. And sometimes when I say friends, I'm not just talking about people your age. I'm talking about your family friends. And parents, can I encourage you? Discipline your kids. The Bible says who God loves, he disciplines. Discipline and punishment, two different things. I don't want to just punish my kids. I want to correct them. I want to correct them. 
It is about correction. The Bible says only a fool doesn't correct his kids. Correct your kids. If you try to be BFFs, I was a student pastor for 15 years. I watched this happen. I watched mom and dad. I watched mom and dad. They're just trying to be all cool. They're trying to, they're trying to be best friends with their kids. And the problem was it didn't work. It never does. And their kids never respected them because the kids never knew where the boundaries were. And the kids did whatever they wanted to because they knew they would get away with it. And they could talk to a teacher this way. They could talk to a principal that way. They could talk to a law enforcer that way. And mom and dad would always have their back because Johnny, little Johnny's always right. So little Johnny ends up living a life thinking he's always right. And no one can tell him different. That's who he is. And little Johnny has to pay for it later. You with me? Parents, discipline your kids. If you don't, the law enforcement will. You with me? Discipline your kids. The Bible says don't hate discipline because God loves and God corrects. And whom God corrects, he does it because he loves. So, so don't let your kids do whatever and get away with it. And then, parents, I would say this. I would tell you, be on the same page. Be on the same page. Husbands, you're married. You'll stand before God if you're a Christian give an account for your family. You'll do that. Wives, hold your husband's ladder. Don't shake it. Don't move it. Don't hide it. Don't sell it in a yard sale. I know what's wrong with my husband. He's just not a man. You won't let him be. My God, I feel that one right there. I feel that one. Step off so he can step up because he'll never step up because you on it. I'm paying every one of y'all that just, you just, I'm telling you. Because you know what? There's some men in this room. I like the fact the lady's saying that because there's some men in the rooms that want to say amen, but they're scared of their wife. <laughs> no, he didn't. Yes, he did. And husbands, it ain't about you the man, you the king, you the, no, no, it's not about that. You to love her like Christ loved the church. So when she's disciplined, little Susie, little Johnny, hold her ladder. Don't be like, oh, come to daddy. Daddy love you. Come here. Mommy just doesn't love you. you kidding me? They're not going to respect that. Authority issues don't start in the classroom. I'm trying to preach today. They start at home. Somebody. 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 Wake up and discipline your kids. Correct your kids so the law doesn't have to. Because they're worth it. I'm telling you, our kids know, man. Listen, listen. Live right. Walk humbly with your God. You mess up, you're going to mess up. Daddy messed up. Mama messed up. Daddy messed up probably more than mama messed up. You're going to mess up. Don't lie about it. Don't hide it. I'm going to tell on Riley real quick. Riley was in the gym last week. I was working out. And the Spirit of God prompted my heart, go check on Riley. I can see Riley. <laughs> I'm like, okay, go check on Riley. The Spirit of God prompts your heart, time matters. So I get over to check on Riley. I get over there. She's on the couch. She's got her iPad. Things are all good. The world's fine. She's into something. She didn't even see me come up. She didn't see me stand next to her. We have a rule with our kids. Don't be on YouTube. There's a lot of stuff on YouTube I don't want them seeing because what comes in here affects here. Are you with me, parents? But I just let them do whatever they want, man. They make my life miserable. That's because you're weak. You might not come back next week, but I got you right now. I love you. I'm trying to help you. I promise you. I looked over at Riley, and I said, hey, Riley. And as soon as she heard my voice, she looked kind of like the voice of God. It was. She thought she saw God. Then my eyes went, sting. She looked up at me like that. I said, Riley, kind of like God calling Adam in the garden. He jumped over in them bushes so fast. <laughs> I said, Riley. And she took her iPad and she put it behind her back. And she's like, hey, Daddy. I love you, Daddy. How are you? Oh, Daddy, look at your muscles. I'm like, that's dang right. Look at my muscles. I said, what you watching? Oh, nothing. And she's trying to clear it. <laughs> low, low, low. I mean, she, she, she's going low. And I said, <laughs> just out of her hands. 
And I didn't have to tell her what she's doing. She told me, I'm sorry, Dad, I'm not supposed to be on YouTube. I'm supposed to be on Kiss YouTube. And it's not Kiss YouTube. It's real YouTube. <laughs> it busted. I said, let me just take that. I said, and she was in front of girls. So I didn't make a big scene. Didn't want to embarrass her. I said, we're going to talk about this later. So when Mama was there, Mama was ready to leave. Riley came, did the whole hugs and all that. Daddy, I'm sorry, I'll delete, I deleted uh, kids' YouTube off my, I can't even go back to it. I said, that's not the issue because you weren't on that. You were on what I said not to be on. So give me that iPad. And I threw it in the gym bag and started working on the muscles again. <laughs> we got to step up with our kids Amen. because, listen to me, and here's the end of the story. Listen, listen. Amnon not only raped his sister, but Absalom held on to the anger. And because David refused to correct his son, Amnon, Absalom said, I'll take revenge into my own hands. And the end of the story is that Absalom went to David and said, hey, I want to throw a party. You come. David said, no, man, uh, no, because you throw a party, you're going to have to pay for everyone. Don't pay for all that. If I come, all my servants come, all my homies come, my boys come. My, they, they all come, and you don't, you don't just keep your money, son. I won't go. And Absalom said, fine, make sure, make sure or decree it that Amnon is there. And David says, why Amnon? David had a little gut check. Why Amnon? Boy, isn't it all about the questions we ask? Why am not? Ah, no, 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 no worries. No problem. Just make sure he's there. And sure enough, and he had told all his friends, here's what we're going to do. When he shows up, we're going to get him drunk. And when he gets drunk, kill him. At my word, don't be afraid. It's my command. You're under my authority. I'm strong enough to take whoever. And dad ain't going to say anything because dad didn't do nothing with Amnon. Dad ain't going to do nothing with Absalom. Absalom, ladies, had hair. The Bible says I like hair. That was so awesome. In the Bible, men and women were jealous of it. They did this thing. <laughs> Absalom was like, that ain't going to do nothing. That ain't going to mess with this. And you know what he did? He got him drunk. Amnon got drunk. And Absalom said, kill him. And they all killed him. They all killed him. If I had more time, I'd tell you how the story turns out even more. But you can read it, 2 Samuel 13. You ought to go there. You ought to check it out. Here's what I'm telling you. Here's what I'm telling you. Here's what I'm telling you. Be careful the people you let in your life because your friends will determine the direction. And it will determine the quality of your life. Show me your friends. I'll tell you your future. Who said it? Right? Tell me about your friends. Tell me about who you're hanging out with. And I'll tell you about what your future is going to look like. So walk with the wise. Walk with the wise. Are you walking with the wise? Parents, are you being wise? Are you knowing what's going on with your kids, with their lives? Do you discipline them? Do you make sure you know, like, they're making the right friends? In other words, I'm saying get in the game. Like, know what's happening in the home. David was passive, and it cost him. We can't afford to be passive because it will affect us. So it's not enough to have friends that share the same interests, but they do not have the same values because we more than likely won't pull their values up. They'll drag us down and we'll forget they even had values because the friends in our lives determine the direction bow your heads. I want to pray for us. God, may we all take this message to heart. May we not just be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. May we do a friend inventory. God, may we be willing to walk away slowly from bad relationships, negative relationships. God, help us to surround ourselves with the right people that will, that will be filled with grace. They're kind to us, but they love us enough to tell us the truth. When we go off course, they tell us. When we start to stray, they tell us. When we get out of our lane, they tell us. Because they want what's best for us. God, may we not be so insecure that we just surround ourselves with people that will flatter us, but people that will love us at all times and challenge us to speak the truth when needed. Help us all, I pray. And God, help us not only to choose those kind of friends, but God, here's the message. Help us to be that kind of friend. David named his first boy 
faithful. And David wasn't faithful. And it set the course, the trajectory for his family's future. God, may we be faithful so that those who come behind us are faithful, not faithless. And I prayed in the name of Jesus. With heads bowed and eyes closed, we never, ever like to end a gathering without giving you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. Here's the gospel. The gospel is that God started everything out. It was beautiful and perfect. And sin came into the world and it was it, it changed everything. It separated man from God, put him at a distance. It created a chasm. And because there was sin, now there was death. And because there's still sin today, there is still death. Because the punishment of sin is death. And so Jesus loved us so much that Jesus laid his life down and died. He was the great substitution. It was reckless love. He put down his own life so that you and I could get what he deserved. And he paid for what we deserved. He absorbed God's wrath and anger and punishment in full for all at once on the cross of Calvary. God the Father turned his back because he couldn't even look. He didn't look at sin. He didn't wink at sin. He didn't laugh at sin. And Jesus, for the first time, was separated from the Father. And he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the answer to that question was sin. Because sin separates. But Jesus, who knew no sin, became sin. So you and I could be made right with him. The scripture tells us that if we'll put our faith and trust in Christ alone, in what Jesus did for us on the cross, he died, he was buried, and on the third day he rose. And if we'll put our faith in Jesus, blood and righteousness, we'll have forgiveness. We'll be called the children of God. That's how you get into heaven. It's the only way. There is no ticket. You don't get in by denomination. You don't get in by membership of a church. You don't get in because you went to this church or that church. You don't get in because you had a Bible or 20 Bibles. You don't get in because grandfather was a deacon or daddy was a pastor. You get in because only the blood of Jesus has washed away your sin. Has that happened to you? If it hasn't, today's the day of salvation. If you're watching online, today's your day. If you're in Navarre, today's your day. If you're in Blackwater, tonight is your night. If you're right here in Gulf Breeze, today's your day. Scripture tells us very clearly, if we will confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, and if we'll believe that he not only died, but he rose again, the Bible says we will be forgiven of all of our sins. And many people today, I'm praying and believing God unapologetically for 25 today, for 25 people to cross that line of faith in five gatherings, 25 people, maybe you're one of them, and the Spirit of God is convicting you right now. You want to get up. You want to leave. You don't want to stay in here. That, that's because the enemy is trying to lie to you some more. You need Jesus. If you'll call on his name, he'll forgive your sins. He'll save you. He'll make you new. He'll teach you how to live. So I want to lead you in a sinner's prayer. You're not praying to me, and you're not praying through me. I can't forgive you. Only God can. No man, no woman can forgive you of all of your sins. Only Jesus can do that. And if you'll pray with me right now, I'll say a prayer. You repeat after me. We'll pray it together. Here we go. Jesus, I confess I'm a sinner. You've seen all of my sins, and I'm guilty. But I thank you for your grace. I can't earn it. I don't deserve it. But you love me, and you died for me, and you rose again. And I believe it. I receive it. I now give you my life. I receive your life. Teach me how to live. In Jesus' name, heads bowed and eyes closed. On the count of three, if you did that, would you raise up your hand? Would you hold it up high? On the count of three, we want to celebrate. We want to clap. The Bible says right now there's a party in heaven. People have crossed the line of faith. Heaven is rejoicing. Angels are dancing. Jesus is smiling. Raise your hand up. We want to help you. Give you a gift. On, on the count of three, one, two, three. Right now, that's right. Hold it up. Hold it up. Hold it up, please. Hold it up. I see that hand. Hold it up high. Hold it up, that's right, I see that, that's right, see your hand, come on the bar, hold it up, that's right, back water, hold it up, hold it up, and if you're watching, you're watching via live stream, please let us know, please let us know that today, today is the day 
that Christ came into your life. Let us know. Would you? I want to tell you three things you need to know. One thing you got to do. Here it is. Number one, Jesus will never leave you. If you invited him into your life, nothing you can ever do to unbecome his child. Number one, he'll never leave you. Number two, your next step is baptism. But I've already been baptized. But baptism comes after you receive Jesus. Not before. It's after. That's it. Number two. Number three, go tell someone. Tell them that Jesus made me brand new. You have to know all the Bible. You just tell them. I once was blind, but now I see. I had a past. But Jesus set me free. Just tell them. Tell somebody. And the one thing, the one thing I want you to do, I want you, as soon as we dismiss in a few minutes, I want you to walk out these doors, go to the tent. I want you to tell them. I want you to go out there and tell them. It's all you got to say. Just tell them. Jesus made me new today. Jesus made me new today. And they will help you take your next right step. So proud of you guys. Let's celebrate one more time all that God did.